Hey everyone, you know who it is. It's your girl Monica Sekmet Grant of Young Boss Media. And today we are here with another mentorship call. We have a very special guest coming all the way from Nigeria. He uh, started his own company, Refueling Airplanes. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever even thought about that as a business that you could start. That's where we're going today. Now, um, the purpose of these calls are to want to introduce you to new people, new entrepreneurs, leaders in your community that are doing amazing work. And so today we're going to be speaking with an engineer. His name is Ego Einstein Utimo, and he is the CEO of Stein Energy. Welcome to the platform. How are you doing today? Uh, very fine. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, everybody out there, uh, it's great to be here today. Thank you very much. Absolutely, absolutely. So one, uh, just tell us about, just give us a little background about who you are. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Igor Temu, uh, Einstein Igor Temu. I'm a Nigerian. Uh, I was born in 1984, February 29th. I'm a special one. It's one of those guys who come one time in four years, so saves me all the <laughs> birthday monies. <laughs> um, I had my primary education at Kobodi uh, International School. Then went to the prestigious government called Jugeli. I mean, it's one uh, institution that was founded in 1945. The the lot. I think we have a we have a US branch as well. So we're, we're that powerful. We're over well close to 80 years as as as, as a secondary school. Then I went to go um, University of Port Harcourt. Had a degree in petroleum engineering and that. Um, my dad was in the army. I, I really need to specify that. My dad was in the army. So most of the things I learned, you know, growing up, trying to get ready for life, discipline, first of all, came from my dad. So my mom was just, you know, a petty trader. Come, those of you who's been to Africa before, you know, um, the moms, the moms really have a special place in our heart. They do a lot. So I've got brothers and sisters. I've got an elder sister. She's in uh, Minnesota right now. Joy. Her name is Joy. She lives in Minnesota. So, yeah, that's my family. You know, got brothers and sisters, and and I'm married. I'm married to. Um, I look at her and I say, you know what? God just felt so sorry for me, and He compensated me with a very beautiful woman. She's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's half Nigerian and half Indian. Her name is Molina. So that's that's basically me. That's beautiful. Good for you. Good for you. God has blessed you. Now, I want to talk yeah. about your, your, your military upbringing um, because you speak about that a lot uh, in an article that I read about you. What about your military upbringing like, um, influenced you to where you are now? Well, I think, I think it's the discipline. You know, I, 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 um, I'm a Catholic, you know, so my dad always ensured that we go to money masses before we go to school. Mm -hmm. So... Money masses usually start like 0600. So we should be up by maybe 0430 or 0500, getting ready to go to, to church. So that, that, you know, I can't sleep beyond 5, 5 a.m. It's not, I'm, my body's already programmed for that. And you know how it is with the military. It's like everybody blows the whistle, pew, 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 when everybody stands up and everybody's moving out of their bunks. That's how we grew up. So that alone prepared me. Till today, my strongest times are in the mornings. I can achieve anything from 5 a.m. to 11 a.m. That's my strong point. Mm. You know, that, that, that also came about that. Then, uh, to be prepared, my dad always ensured that uh, if I was going to school tomorrow, today I have my uniforms iron. I mean, it was from my dad. I knew that the tip edge of the iron is meant for the collars. You know, a man's shirt, you have a collar on the side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what it was designed for. So the iron goes directly into it. So you know what it is, mm -hmm. you know, like 10 years, 12 years old, 15 years old, and you, are, you get to iron an army khaki. It's not very easy. So, <laughs> so with him, I learned to be prepared, you know, till date, when I, before I get ready for work, like tomorrow, today, I already have my clothes ironed out. So I know what I'm wearing. It just, it just makes you ready for anything. Right. It just makes you ready for anything. Discipline is key. Diligence and hard work. 
it just it just make I think I think those are the factors that's really kept me going up to this point. That's right. This one is just hard work. I love that. I love that. Now tell me, um, you went into the military after high school, correct? Sorry. Did Did you end up going into the military yourself? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or well, you, you know, after graduation, um, after graduation, it, 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 I mean, those of you who are connected to the Nigerian environment to tell you how difficult it is to get a job, regardless of how you graduate, you know, whether you graduate with the first class or anything, it's really very tough. So it got to a point, I was, I was, I was tired, you know, I had tried everything. I, I went to an interview once and the guy said to me, I'm not going to hire you because I don't want any smart guy coming to take my job. You know, so, so I got so frustrated. And in 2011, I bought the, the form to join the army. <laughs> so while I was waiting for the, the, to write the exams and all, I got my first job in 2012. So that's how I missed out on the army. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. You're running. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. So, so tell me about your your work career because you you found a path in aviation. How did that happen? Well, um, I, like I always say, you know, my story is is one of miracles. You know, I I I just look back and I and I see God's immense power. Um, there was a guy I met when I was in year three. You know, then I was studying. He came from his master's program and. I really assisted because he was working then, so he couldn't really come to school that much. So I really, really assisted him and through that time. So I got to a point in 2012, uh, like I said, it was still in that period where I'd, I had wanted to go to the army. Things were really tough. I was lying down one day. I, that same day, I had a dream. My, I saw my dad in the dream, and he said to me, you know, I've seen you. You've suffered enough. I'm going to help you. What I'm saying now is my real life story. And after that, I got a knock on the door. And when I opened the door, it was this same guy. And I asked him, I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I've been looking for you. I said, okay. He said, come with me. So I followed him, got into the car. He drove straight to the airport. And we got into one very lovely looking place. Mm -hmm. When we entered, he kept me at the conference room. A couple of minutes later, he came up with someone and he said to me, you're not my friend. You're not my brother. This is an interview. I don't forget those words. He says, you're not my friend. Uh, and he says, this is an interview. And he goes and asks me, what do you know about aviation fuel? What do you know about this? You know, those were things that I had previously worked on on this project for him. So it was a slow, it was a swift ride for me. And then he said, how much do you want us to pay you? I mean, for a guy who's not seen anything, hearing you want to be paid, <laughs> I just went... 100,000 there, which is about uh, over $300 per month. Mm. I was so excited. So, <laughs> yeah, bless so, you. I, you can work for me. You can work for me. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, so, I mean, from zero to $300, it was like heaven yeah. to me. Yeah. You know, so I was really excited and I didn't care. I just wanted to walk and that's my story. That's how I got here. It was never planned. It was God all along. It was never planned. Got yeah. it. But, but let's speak about the aviation side because you do aviation refueling. You refuel planes. And so yeah. when, when, when I'm coming up and I hear about people working at the airport, they're actually like working inside the airport. They're, you know, putting bags on the plane. They're, they're at the counter. Um, you're actually an instrumental role in the movement of people. You make sure that there's fuel on the plane. That's a big deal. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, most people were the reason why you wait before you board. Ah. You know, but the reason why when, when your aircraft touches down and you're in the terminal, and they tell you, oh, that's your flight coming in from L.A. and going to New York. And you see the aircraft where the reason why you sit down and wait, we have to move in. You know, refueling process is so, so wonderful that if you experience it once, you can't sit behind the desk. 
Mm. And it's very, very, you have to be very, very careful. Pressure, the, you have to operate at the, not at the pressure. You need to understand that before you go into the aircraft, the anti-collision lights are off. It, in fact, it is one petroleum product that you can't, we, we have a balance in the industry here in Nigeria. We say, look, do everything you need to do right because there's no bus stop up there. There's no bus stop up there. So if you must be sure that all your quality control checks are in place and make sure that whatever goes into the aircraft is a clean, dry, on, a, on, on specification fuel. So mm -hmm. it's a very interesting job. It's a very, very interesting job. And, and there are diff different ways you can do it. You can do it using uh, an aircraft refueler, which is a vehicle like a truck with the refueling capabilities, filters and all. Okay. Or you could also do it using a hydrant system, which is what most of your airports in the U.S. have. You know, you have when you walk next time when you walk through the, the, the airport ramp, please look on the airport floor. You will notice some round, solid metals there on the floor. I know exactly what you're talking about. So that's where the like you put like uh, a tube, right? Yeah, yeah. From there to the plane. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's called a hydrant pit valve. Hydrant pit that's, valve. Okay. Yeah. So you can for such systems, what it means is the pipeline is the the storage facility is somewhere around the airport. So a pipeline has been channeled to the air, to the airport to the to the ramp floor where you can take fuel. But that's not the case in Nigeria, you know. So we have trucks, we call them Bowsers, that goes in to fuel the aircraft. So it's it's just, it's one beautiful aspect of, of, of uh, technicalities that most people don't know about. Where the reason we, we, we jokingly say we keep them hydrated. So. I like that. So we're the I guys like that. that keeps the aircraft hydrated, yeah, so. So when this, when this, this person took you on an interview and you got the $300 position, um, this was the job that you were then learning um, at the time. Yeah, no, I, I, at that time, um, I didn't know anything about it. Okay. I only, I knew it theoretically to an extent. And when they gave me this job, uh, you know, I owe my gratitude to my first operation manager, engineer Peter Dia, wonderful, wonderful, amazing African. He taught me everything I needed to know mm -hmm. from the storage facilities to the equipment. In fact, I had my first uh, IATA, IATA being the international body for air transport. I had my first interview barely five months when I started working. And that's where it built me from. I knew there were standards because, you know, before me, there were people, the guys I met there were twice my age. And I was the only graduate there. So, you know, in Africa, when you say Oga, it means you're, you're respected, you're the boss. And I remember the first old man I met, he said, Oga, sir, um, welcome. And I said, thank you, sir. He said, I wanted to follow him to the ramp. He said, Oga, no, 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 this one is not for you. And I said, no, I want to learn. I am not, the, I am the Oga on paper. I want to learn. Mm -hmm. And the old guy, Chochi Walu, that's his name. God bless him. He's in Abuja now. He was really okay. instrumental for me learning the basics. So my advice to most people is no matter how, you know, no matter what kind of qualifications you have academically, when you go into a job, you're a novice, keep your head down, mm -hmm. be humble, learn. And trust me, humility will take you a long way. So I didn't know anything about aircraft refueling. I learned from those guys who, who were uneducated, who just wanted to go refuel who saw themselves like glorified fuel attendants. But I just learned being a glorified uh, fuel attendant and backing it up with my education. And most importantly, by the grace of God, that's why that's I'm right. here where I am today. That's right. That's right. I love that. Now, from, your, from just working a job and learning the field, what made you want to go and start your own company? Starting Stein Energy is a miracle. I never thought I was going to. I never thought I was going to own one. Yeah, tell me about it. The tell only, story. The, the only I thought I was good enough to get to be uh, an operations manager someday. That's all I aimed for. Mm -hmm. But you know, sometime in 2018, I had worked between 2016 to 2018. I had worked two years and four months with my previous employer, and I wasn't paid. Mm -hmm. They told me the company was going down. You know, it got to a point 
I resigned. That was in April, yeah, yeah, March 5th, 2018. And uh, at that time, my my very beloved wife uh, was pregnant, you know, so, but uh, we had a miscarriage. So it was oh, really an emotionally tough time for us. And, and that day when we were coming back from the hospital, I, I just won down, I was driving and I said, God, you know what? I'm tired of you. You said, serve me. I tried to serve you. You say, mm. do the right things. I try to do the right things. And you do this to me? You know what? Mm. I'm done with you. That's what I said. Mm -hmm. I know he showed me mercy anyway. <laughs> so a few weeks later, my, my mother-in-law calls me and said, I was praying. And God said to me to tell you that I have heard what you are saying. And I've decided that if I don't come to you now, you would derail. Tell your son-in-law that I will come to him like a thief in the night. That's all she said to me. Mm -hmm. So on May 4th, 2018, I went to see my father Figo. My biological father is passed. He died in 20... In fact, today, uh, July 20th, 2009, that's when my, my father died. Oh, rest so in peace. I, yeah. So I have this, this guy who's been like a father to me the whole time. So I went to see him on, on May 4th. And he kept asking because I had, I had the, an opportunity with Hashi Energy uh, in Goma, Congo DR. So I was waiting for, for them to call me up. So he asked me and said, what's going on with you? I said, well, I'm still waiting. And then he said to me, Ego, I have seen you walk. Are you sure you can't do this on your own? And I said, well, daddy, you know, I don't know. It's going to cost a lot. And he said, what do you need? And I told him, I, well, if I was going to start, I would need a storage facility, this and that and that. Monica, he asked me, how much do you need? And I said, okay. well, XX amount of millions. He said, okay, don't worry. God will provide someday. And then he left me. Mm. Monica, just the way I'm talking to you right now, I got the excess amount, millions of Naira. Mm. He gave me for nothing. Mm. I started in Stein Energy without a loan. He gave me, and he, he gave me a life for nothing. Wow. Wow. That's Please beautiful. tell me, how is that not a thief in the night? God is good. God is good. God is great. Mm -hmm. That's why I keep telling people Stein Energy is a miracle. That's it was right. never planned for. That's it right. is when when we when we opened the office on July 1st, God gave the word. Genesis 26. He said to Isaac, he said, and Isaac, but I changed it to my name. He says, and ego digged Stein Energy. And for that they strove not. Mm. And he called the name of the place Rehoboth, for the Lord has created the place for us, and we shall enlarge in this land. That's God's that's word. Right. It's absolute. That's it right. doesn't change. That's right. And then when we brought our first equipment in, he gave me another word. He said, Zechariah 4, he said, the angel asked Ego and said, do you know what these things are? And he says, Ego replied and said, no, my Lord. And he says, it is not by power, it is not by might, it is by the spirit, thus saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then God confirmed it in his forehand, said, Who art thou, O great mountain? Before ego and stein energy, I will make you a molehill. Mm. That's my testimony. Mm. So let me not take much time on that. I just give God all the glory. Stein energy is a miracle. It was nah, never planned. This is Sunday service. <laughs> <laughs> this is Sunday service. But, but you know, yeah. I, I, I have a similar testimony um, that I always speak about. And um, sometimes in our lowest, um, that's when we find God. You know, um, a lot, most of the times in our lowest, that's when we have to find God. And um, our, our entire lives start to change and pivot. Um, because what we were going through is not what we have to continue to go through, you know, and God shows like, listen, when you're ready, I'll, I'll change your life. But sometimes you just ain't ready. Sometimes you like that old life. Sometimes you like the, the old ways. And it's when you get to your lowest where it's just like, listen, I'm done. I, I tried it. I tried it on my own. Please help me. 
you know. <laughs> so I get yeah. it. I get it. I definitely wouldn't have a media company without getting on my knees and praying for you know the life sure. that I wanted for me, you know. Sure. So I I I get it one hundred percent, one thousand percent. Now, um, so 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 I told you before we started, just, just speaking about aviation refueling, um, yeah. the business side of aviation refueling. Can you walk us through that? Um, because right now, like 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 we we're not your competitors. Like it's not like we can go to JFK and say, or maybe we can. Like I don't know. I would like tell me like what this world looks like. Can I go to JFK and say, hey, I just started an aviation refueling company. I want it, I want you to be one of our vendors. I want I want you to be one of our clients. How does this work? What the, what is this business model? What do you do on a day to day basis? Take us through your your experience as a CEO. Well, uh, first of all, before before I continue on this note, uh, it will it will not be complete if I don't mention his name, engineer Isewede Aswemi. God bless you for for putting me on this platform where I am because without you, I wouldn't be talking to Monica. So wherever you are, I really am mm-hmm. grateful. You've been a wonderful father. And I continue to ask God for the grace to know the right things to do and the courage to do it so that I can make you proud. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, that's just me appreciating him. Okay. So, um, it's a process. Aviation fuel, it's a process. Uh, I'm going to speak in the, in the African, in the, let me be African and Nigerian about it because if I start mixing up with the way it is over there in the U.S., it gets confusing. So this is where I pray, this is what I understand. Got it. There, first of all, uh, you can actually, I don't know what the regulations are there, but I think you can actually walk to JFK, meet with the Civil Aviation Authority, and you can actually start your refueling company if you do all the paperwork. It's, 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 I think the paperwork are basically the same here. You need an operating license. So, but first of all, we start a normal operation day with a storage facility. You either call it, we call it a bulk fuel installation. At the moment, we have 20, uh, 60,000 liters capacity or storage facility where we put the, the jet fuel. Um, you guys in the US, you could use jet or jet A1 or uh, I think the military uses JP8. So there, there's Afgas, there's leaded 110. There are lots of different grades of, of jet fuel. But in Africa here in Nigeria, we use jet A1. Okay. So jet A1 is a blend of kerosene at different, uh, about 350 degrees Celsius or so. It comes out as, you know, the kerosene people in Africa used to cook. It's called uh, the DPK, the dual purpose kerosene. But jet A1 is 80K automotive turbine kerosene. So there's a difference between both, both uh, kerosene blends now. So essentially, Jet A1 that we use in Africa's aviation fuel is, um, is a kerosene blend of fuel. So it goes through a lot of processes from the refinery to the storage facility, through the trucks that will bring them to our own facility, uh, there's a lot of quality control checks that needs to be done. First of all, you have to ensure that there's no water in the fuel. Okay. Water is one element that must never be in a jet fuel because up there, temperatures are like what? Minus 30, minus 40. Uh, if, if there's water in the fuel, the engine wow. won't burn and it just crystallizes and the aircraft falls down like a pin. So we ensure that there is no water, there's no contaminant. So that's why at every stage of jet fuel processes, water must be eliminated. Sediments must be eliminated. Dirt and particles must be eliminated because any trace of that in the aircraft engine, you have just killed over 300 persons. Mm. Yeah. So that's why when you see when an aircraft crashes, one of the first things that is done is that the fuel sample is usually taken. The fuel sample is taken. The, okay. the, the location where the, last, the aircraft last took fuel, uh, that's why till today, whatever fuel that we, we bring into our facility, we always keep a sample for a minimum of at least one year. Wow. So that should there be any incident, and we, and we batch them up. 
So from all the refinery through the storages, then the, pro the, the product now, let me use the word product, Jet A1 meaning product, gets to our facility. Now it comes in a truck, a bridger. Mm -hmm. Now before the bridger discharges what is in its, its content, we have to do a quality control check. The visual check, we use a tube called the shell water detector. It has a membrane, it's a small tube. The essence is it detects even the minutest trace of water in the fuel. So when we see any trace of water, that field is rejected immediately and sent back. When it passes all that, we now do the quality checks, which means you have to use your hydrometer, you use a thermometer, then you check against an observed density chart. When all that is done and you have passed all the quality control, the fuel is now pumped through a filter in the storage facility okay. at a specified pressure into the facility. Now, that's just one stage. Now, every what is that, day... What is, what is that stage called? Uh, that's, that's the receiving stage. You're receiving the product into the product receipts. It's called the product receipts. But, you know, before you receive the product you have to drain the, 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 the bridger. A draining is essential. Draining is a must. Draining is a must. You know, we're here in Africa, or specifically in Port Harcourt, Nigeria, as I'm talking to you right now, it's raining. So it is always raining. Almost all year round, it is raining. Mm -hmm. So you need to drain. You know, if, if, you, if you put... Because it's, the, the bridges are metal steel, when, when water comes into them, when rain falls on them, it becomes very cool inside. So you build up water. So we drain them. We drain before we even start doing anything. Now, when the product is going into the tank, it goes through a filtration process. Uh, there's always a filter vessel there that contains a coalizer and a separator. What the coalizer and the separator does is it ensures that it takes out even the minutest trace of water before it goes into the storage facility. Wow. Now... In the storage facility, Question, every is, day... Is, is this like a filter, like it's going through um, a, a process and then it's dropping off the water, or is like the water evaporated through heat? No, it, it goes through a process and drops off the filter drain, drain points. Got it. So we collect all the water. That's why every story, whatever product you have in the tank, every day you must drain. Got it. You must drain every day. You have to, the, the, the goal is eliminate water, microbial growth, dirt, contaminants, and any other particle. Got so it. that's just for the storage. Now, when you are going to load back into your refueling vehicle, it passes through the filter again into your refueling vehicle through what is called a bottom loading system. Now, you must understand that uh, jet fuel, you can't transfer jet fuel, that's jet A1 now, you can't transfer it from one medium to another without using a bonding cable. What's Even that? when you're refueling the aircraft, there's something called a bonding cable. Mm -hmm. It's a must. If for any reason you're refueling or doing any refueling processes and the bonding cable disconnects, you must stop immediately. Why? The that when, when fuel passes through different mediums, it builds up a lot, a high amount of electrostatic charges. Hmm. So it is the bonding cable that dissipates these electrostatic charges. So if you don't bond while you're doing your refueling operation, you are just, you are, you're just preparing yourself for a fire outbreak. Oh, wow. H how so big is, is the, this cable? How big is the cable? It's a very small cable. It's 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 uh, it's a very small cable, about the size of my. It's it's wow. a very small cable, cable. Okay. about about an inch. You know, it's it, at the end of it is attached a crocodile clip. So you must connect the bonding cable. In fact, we used to. I used to train the last. I say the first thing out is always the last thing out. Mm -hmm. And the first the first thing in is the last thing out, and the first thing in is your bonding cable. Okay. So, so from the, from that you get the you get the storage you get the the fuel from the storage into your equipment which is your Bowser now and you drive to the airfield. First of all, you, we get to ask the, the pilots or the ground representative, how many liters of fuel do you want, and they mm -hmm. specify. 
then you connect your host. That's what is called a refueling host. Okay. Now, in the cases of uh, seven three sevens and all, you use what is called the underwing pressure hose. So what it means is if this is your aircraft wing, the hose comes underneath and connect to it. That's why it's called the underwing. It goes underneath the wing? Yes. Okay. On the, yeah, that's what's called underwing refueling. Okay. It's a high pressure refueling. At least it must not exceed between 50 to 70 p um, PSIs. Okay. Yeah. Then there's another kind of refueling again, which you use for helicopters and light aircraft. Now, this is the aircraft wings. The fueling point goes over wing. Mm -hmm. So this is called the over wing refueling. This is called the under wing refueling. So like for a 747, is that underwing? Yes. Okay. For helicopters, so, it's overwing. And like maybe like one of those small propeller planes, that's overwing. Exactly, overwing. And and the, the overwing nozzle is more like the nozzle you use at your gas station when you buy buy, buy fuel into your car. Got it. I'm with you. I'm yeah. With you. So it's just a little tweak. OP OPW twenty five. That's that's the that's the nozzle uh, rating. Got it. Well, Essentially, it's a very careful process, a process that must eliminate water. Whatever you do, whatever you put into the aircraft, you must ensure that it is clean, bright and clear, clean, on spec, dry fuel. There must not be water contaminants or any such. So it's a very highly specialized job. Very, very highly specialized job. Very much. Yeah. How much... So for, I guess, for a normal plane that fits like 200 people, like how much fuel does that require to fill up a plane? Well, it depends. Let's take the, the context in which we work here. For instance, the, tri the conventional uh, 737s going from Port Harcourt to Lagos, we'll be looking at about 3,500 to 6,000 liters. Wow. Yeah, I think that the, the, if I'm correct, uh, the A380... All the triple seven point seven 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 takes about three hundred and eighty thousand liters from a flight from maybe Australia to the US. Mm. Yeah, I think so. A big yeah. Plan. yeah. The fuel is it going into like a tank inside the airplane? Like, is it like uh, it's a big tank? Yes, aircraft tanks. Okay, let me ask you yeah. this. So, like, so say if you're flying from Australia to New York. Um, Cause you know, like when you're driving, like you know when you're you're going on E. Like if you're flying from Australia to New York, is your is your tank still on half when it gets to New York, or is it on E when it gets to New York? Like, how big are these tanks? And say if something happens and they have to stay in the air and circle around because they can't land, how much extra uh, fuel is are in these planes? Well, I think it I think it depends it depends on the location in which the the aircraft is flying. But I think there, there are different, there are lots of tanks, about three, four or so tanks, and there's always a contingency tank in the air, air okay. in the in the in the in the tanks. I it is almost a very rare case, very rare case before you find out that that uh, that an aircraft runs out of jet fuel, except maybe there's a me mechanical issue that leads to the fuel leaking. But I, I think I think it's it's a rare case. I, it doesn't get to eat. Let's let's use the word E now. When it gets to a car, it doesn't yeah. get to E. It's always good enough for you to hover around if there's any emergency for a good amount of time. And if you're running out and you're not able to land, I'm sure there's a the nearest airport with fuel that you can divert to that that fuel can carry you. But there's always a contingency when it comes to fuel on the yeah. aircraft. Yeah. Got it. That's very helpful. Now let, let's talk about the, the business side of it a little bit. Um, because yeah. I can already see there's, there's a lot of players in, in here. Um, the fuel comes from a place, you know, so I'm, I'm interested in how do you, how do we get this fuel? And then you're dealing with airports and airplanes. How do you go into the airport? I mean, you kind of said that before with JFK, but like, what is the conversation when you start your business and say, all right, I want to now um, refuel your planes. What does the business model look like? Well, well, in terms in terms of the operation, there's always a, a thing like let me use a case in which we walk. Uh, we don't come through to fuel the plane from the normal entrance in which you go into your airport. There's always a back. Let me use the term. There's always a back gate or a back door for which you come into the ramp. There's an access road for which you come. So, you know, 
on the ramp, the passenger always has the right of way. So when you drive into columns where there are passengers, you have to stop for the, the passengers to get into the aircraft. But, you know, one thing about aircraft refueling is that um, it is all it is always advisable that you don't fill the aircraft when people are on board. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost a rare case for you to do that. I think in my whole career, I've been able to fill an aircraft with passengers on board, but then I had approval and I had a, a fire truck on standby. In fact, two fire trucks on standby, just in case. I think, I think that's what we call hot refueling. I've been able to do hot refueling like two or three times. Uh, I was privileged to do it for the president of Ghana sometime in uh, 2015, 2016 or thereabout. Yeah, it was, it was a Ghanaian uh, Air Force aircraft flying in their president at the time. Was it John Kufo or somebody at the time? You know, so uh, we come through an access gate from the back and we, we go right into the aircraft and we fuel. But for Stein Energy, we, we currently fuel um, 328, Donia 328, uh, and, and helicopters and some light aircraft, so, and private jets, mm -hmm. Challengers, Gulf Streams, Hawkers, and all. So the, the access road, like in front of our fueling vehicle, every fueling vehicle worldwide, there's always a sign that says clear exit. You know, the idea is always ensure that your path to the aircraft and the path for which you're going to leave the aircraft is always clear. Mm -hmm. There must not be any obstruction because anything could just go wrong and you have to drive. There, there are lots of uh, safety procedures um, put out there by the Joint Inspection Group, which is JIG primarily the body that controls aviation fuel globally. Um, okay. Yeah, so there are lots of airside safety standards that have been put in place when it comes to aircraft refueling. So we do our best to adhere to the standards. And, and so far, two years plus, we've, we've not had an incident. We've been keeping it going. That's amazing. Now, now, where does the fuel come from? Like, where do you purchase this fuel? From the refineries. From the refineries. Got it. Yeah. So, so if I'm I'm in I'm in America now, so I'm thinking like I want I want to do what you do. Do I just Google refineries? Like, how do I find uh, fuel refineries? And what's that process? Well, you you know you know um, what 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 we're doing now is, has been done by people before. We just mm -hmm. only found better way of doing it. You know, I'm sure I'm sure the the regulatory bodies in the U.S. Will you know? By the time you speak to one or two persons, you can also write a refinery. Your system is more more advanced than what we have. Uh, I think there are a couple of people on LinkedIn who are who also you know um, sell these things, jet fuel and all. I think mm. they can act as an intermediary towards supplying you into your storage facilities. I, I think you have a lot of options up there. A lot, a lot of options that you can. You can get but basically here in nigeria we get from the refineries or the private depots so got it yeah so you contact the refineries and you say hey i need this amount of fuel they i'm sure you send the money um they then bring you um the fuel in a truck yes you, you call it a bridge or a bowser that's what you said a bowser a bridger a, a bridger. bridger this is the bridger a bridger. So they bring you the, the fuel in a bridger and then um, you restart your receiving process into your storage units. Yeah. Okay. So so a part of this is you need, and that's what you told your father, that you needed storage for the fuel. Yeah. And then from your storage unit, that's when you put it on. Is it called a bridger again when you take it to the planes? No, it's called a Bowser, an that's, aircraft that's refueling. Yeah, an aircraft refueler or a Bowser. And then, so then you have your fuel on a Bowser that refuels the plane. Got yeah. It. See, I'm with you. That's why I ask questions because I want to see the whole process. Yeah, oh. that's that's <laughs> been, you. You have just you have just outlined the whole process. Got it. <laughs> Listen, I'm trying to go on business with you, man. You know, I need I need to know what's going on. <laughs> You're welcome, sister. You're always welcome. This is amazing because like, I told you, like I hadn't, I've, I've never, because I think until you're exposed to something, you really just don't think about it. 
You know, I don't know if I've ever thought about how these planes get fuel. I'm just happy to be going somewhere. You know, <laughs> I'm just I'm just happy to leave. And, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm happy that I had a safe trip. You know, um, I want to I would want to ask you about the the water issue. So say yeah. if like if it's raining, if it's, if it's a rainy day when you're flying, how do they protect or how do you protect your your um, your fuel? Like when you're going from the Bowser into the plane, like how do you protect the fuel? Well, here's me. I mean, you know, this is my position, especially when it comes to staying energy. Once it's raining, you don't feel. Okay. We we stay off it. We don't do it. We don't do it one because you've got lightning, you've got, you know, water. We we don't. We don't we we uh, you will have to call someone else, you know, maybe there are people out there who want to cut corners, but for me, safety is priority. We don't go in there. You have to wait till the rain stops for us to go in there. Well, in the, in the, well most times when it happens and you have to go in there as necessary, uh, we, have, we have made provisions for our staffs to properly kitted raincoats, rain boots and all. Uh, and it's a lot easier when you're doing the refueling. We, we can go do the refueling in the rain, but we can't do anything related to the storage facility in the rain. Mm -hmm. Like when the bridge comes, you can't discharge the products when it's raining. But with the aircraft, you can go in there because most times it's on the wing. So the wing, the the okay. aircraft wing already gives you that protection that you need. Okay. You know, but the challenge is when it is over wing, we, we hardly go there because then you're exposed. You know, people could use umbrellas and all that, but I don't take chances with an airplane, so we don't do that. Most especially when it's over wing. Yeah. Yeah, because also the water is in the atmosphere too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here, here's how it works for CR Stein Energy. Uh, look, I, I learned from my dad early on that look, you can't don't destroy the things that you can create. You know, I can I can create a human life. So any processes that will lead me to destroy a human life, I stay off it because I can't create it. I hear that. So when it comes to rain, I'm always very careful, especially when it is over wing and helicopter refueling. Yeah. Because then the, the four ports are exposed. And how 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 much can you do with the with rain? But when it's over wing, we can go in and do it very well. But I we we try to stay off the rain. Try to stay off the rain. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So thank you for that breakdown. Um, I really yeah. appreciate you. Um, you learn something new every day. I, I learned something great today. So this is like a whole week for me. You know, this whole week for some people. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's so let's let's talk about the reality of where we are now in Corona. Um, yeah. Fl flights have definitely slowed down. What is business like right now? Um, just in COVID nineteen. Yeah, well, uh, globally, you know, there are other industries, but I think the aviation industry is the worst hit. Mm -hmm. You know, the aviation industry is the worst hit. Uh, like in one of my recent interviews, I, I said I never thought there was going to be a day when, you know, airports world over will have aircrafts packed and not flying at all, all grounded. You know, you know, when people sign contracts, you always have this column where you have a force majeure, you know, in the event of an act of God and all that. You know, for the first time in my lifetime, I saw the act of God as a force majeure, you know. So um, wow. it's, it's, it's not it's not uh, it's, it's, it's not anything that anybody expected. I tell people, I say. Whatever business plan you have for 2020, throw it out of the window, start all over again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, people see this year as a year when things are terrible. I see it as the rebirth, as the year of the rebirth. Mm -hmm. It's the time, you know, most times when we do all those team building and all those talk, they keep telling people, find time to rest and develop yourself. God gave us enough time. Anybody who comes out of this COVID-19 era without doing anything out of themselves has practically failed. You have right. enough time to look at what you can do. So going back, going back into business, 
I want to say here proudly that I said, I don't know about today, but I was at 8 July 2020. Stein Energy is the only aircraft refueling company in the Federal Republic of Nigeria that has been cleared by NCAA to resume operations. Okay. Congratulations. Yes. yes. So we, we, we put all our processes in place. I mean, this is in the face of other multinationals and other company. We're startup two years old and we top the chart. That for me speaks volumes for us. So whoever is out there in the international community watching this, our record speaks for us. You can check with the Nigeria Civil Aviation Authority. Our records are there and we are very open to business. We're open, very open to opportunities. Let me just put that out there. Let me just sell the company a bit, Monica. Do you think? Do you think? <laughs> I'm trying to be a yeah. partner, you know. Listen, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> you need a so, media arm. See, that's what you need. You need a media arm, and I can be a media arm. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, please, that. those of you out there who want to partner with us, Monica is our link person. Please contact us. She'll always get to us. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but you, and you, you were telling me that it had been a busy week. And so, I, so I'm assuming that that's what you were doing is making sure that you could still be, you know, cream of the crop and rise to the top during the time. Yeah, I didn't quite get that. But going back to the last question, uh, we, we took a dip in March in our, you know, in our revenue, in our sales, okay. in our uplift. I mean, you know, I, I was in a meeting with my, heads of department recently and I said to them, I brought out the chart and I looked at it and I said, you know what, when you see this chart deep in March and gradual pick up in April, May, June, and now July, it shows us where we're a standard company. Go and look at all the big companies in the world. They had a dip in March. They had little, little growth in April, May, June, July, which means we're doing the right thing. I jokingly encourage them with that. So we're picking up. Um, the Nigerian airport opened. I think Lagos, Abuja, and uh, uh, yeah, Lagos, Abuja opened up on the on the on the on the was it on the eleventh on the eighth. So Port Harcourt, which is where I am, we opened up yesterday on the eleventh. Uh, the remaining airports in the country will open on the fifteenth. So as the airports begin to open, uh, we begin to make improvements. And then we look at the remaining five to six months of the year, and God willing, we'll bounce back. So the, 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 the industry will recover, and so will we as well. Amen. Now, are these, um, the, the airports that are open up, are these more domestic flights or are they international? Uh, the domestic. domestic. The process yeah. for starting off uh, international will soon commence, but for now, it's all domestic. Got it. Now, in, in the aviation industry, just in general, what changes um, are you seeing um, uh, COVID ha ha having brought, you know, to this industry? Um, and, and more particularly, like, when can, when do you foresee, like, people being able to travel for real, for real? Because I know, like, if, if I travel now to somewhere, I have to be, you know, on a quarantine for 14 days, you know, minimum. So when would when are when are people saying like we can expect to see some type of normalcy to the industry? Well, you know, when it comes to aviation, the both international and local regulatory authorities. On the international level, you're looking at uh, IATA, and you're looking at uh, ICAO, and maybe for those of us who are aircraft refuelers, you're looking at uh, aircraft refueling companies. Your pardon. Uh, we are looking at the Joint Inspection Group. Uh, let me point out that on March 25th, uh, the Joint Inspection Group issued out the bulletin, the bulletin 128. It's more or less like how we aircraft refueling companies are to respond uh, during this COVID-19 era. You know, So measures are already in place on how we're supposed to conduct our operations, on how we're supposed to deal with the situation, both uh, currently and even after the the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're, we're, we're not all sure where this is gonna go to, you know, especially the, that's the whole COVID-19 uh, thing. We don't know how long this is gonna open up, but we, we hope that uh, before the end of the year, we will see possible 
you know, decline in the numbers of deaths and the numbers of infection. Um, like, like, like we, like I always say, aviation. The, the goal is to ensure that aviation does not become a vector for transmitting this virus anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Uh, you will see changes like in the Nigerian situation now, you know, back in the day, you could just you could book a flight at 1, 1 p.m. And if you can, you could book a flight at, for 2 p.m. at 12 o'clock, 12 noon, you can dash to the airport and meet the flight, you know. Mm -hmm. But now the regulation says you have to be in the airport three hours before your flight. Wow. OK. Yeah. So if you build, if you book a flight for, for, wow. for 3 p.m., yeah, if you book a flight for I'm, 3 p.m. I'm, I'm the person that's like, <laughs> I just make it. <laughs> they might have to call my name over the intercom. I'm like, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> wow. So now, now you have to be at the airport three hours before your flight so that you can go through all the, all the port health authorities, all the checks, all, the, all that needs to be done, getting your information. The, the idea of it is so that if there's an outbreak, you can easily be, be you know, checked and tracked and all and, you know, isolated and, and all that comes with, with this uh, situation in which we're dealing now. So a, a lot is going to change. Travels is not going to be as it was before, especially, I mean, given the case that you have to be there three hours before mm -hmm. a flight. I was jokingly telling my wife a few days ago, I said, you know what? I'm not booking any morning flights again because I'm usually the guy who's at the airport by 0700. So if I'm flying by 0700, it means I have to be at the airport at 0400. I can't afford that for Christ's sake. That's right. So. <laughs> That's right. You know what? It's, it's interesting because like, I think of like all the major catastrophes um, that I've experienced it impacts the aviation industry. So like, I remember being able to go to the airport prior to 9-11 and being able to walk through the whole entire airport with the person that's flying. We're not even flying. We're going to the gate. We're looking at them board. We're waving at the plane, taking off. Hey, I'll see you later. And then 9-11, none of that. You got to drop them off at the corner. <laughs> you got to drop them off at the curb and you can't see them until, you know, next time they come in town. And so... And now this and it's like the aviation industry takes hits. You know, when something bad happens, y'all really take a hit. Um, do y'all speak about that as far as like when you enter this industry, like the risk that's involved in global events and global changes and shifts? Um, because like every, every time I think about like pre 9-11, the airport, it's just something that just stays with me. And now this not being able to fly as much as I want to or move around as much as I want to. Um, what's that kind of, what's the conversation in aviation world around that kind of um, just global event happening? Well, you know, the narratives, the narratives are changing, obviously. Um, once I, I recall early in the outbreak of the pandemic, I attended one of these London business school uh, webinars and I think it was Peter Drucker. And there was yeah, something okay. he said that stuck with me. He said, the problem is not the turbulence. In this case, interpretation, COVID-19 is the turbulence. The problem is not the turbulence. The problem is approaching the turbulence with yesterday's logic. Word. That stuck with me. You've got to change. Things are not the way it was yesterday. You know, for every business, everything is changed. If you approach your businesses, approach your daily activities or whatever you do, thinking you're in 2019, I don't see you making any headway or coming out of it. So you've got to approach with the mentality that this turbulence your case now in the airports you can't say goodbye to your folks inside the airport it is only those who are traveling that are permitted to go into the airports if you know the typical nigerian situation take for instance let me use the word for those of you who understand big men the very rich politicians and all that 
-hmm. When they're traveling, they have, you know, police carrying guns, following them, right? If it's possible, they will even follow them right to the aircraft aircraft uh, door. You know, now you don't have that anymore. It is the big man will have to carry his bag by himself. Oh, wow. <laughs> Welcome, so, sir. <laughs> so I jokingly say, for once in Nigeria, we are all equal. We carry our bags by ourselves. Amen. God has a way. So, <laughs> <laughs> Ego, thank you so much for your time. Like, this was actually great. You gave us so much really rich and unique information that I couldn't have imagined or even planned for. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Awesome. Thank and, you. Yeah, and, and I'm serious about like, being your media arm. So let's continue to talk and however we can work together and help in the future. We're going to do that, you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll be very glad. And maybe someday soon, by the grace of God, I will sit right there in your studio and take another interview. Come on, come on, come on. That, that's the vision. And the studio might be in Nigeria. Quit playing. You know, I'm coming to you. I didn't but, get that. Sorry. I, I, I said the studio might be in Nigeria. Oh, yeah. that's We, we were waiting for you. Please come. <laughs> I got you. I got you. I got you. But thank you so much for your time. That's, that's an hour. Um, you know, and so I'm going to close out the show, but stay on right quick. I'm going to close it out and then I'll come back. Thank you very much, Monica. It was good. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. That is our time. This was an amazing episode. Listen, I was asking the questions to break down. How do you start a refueling company? I had never heard about this until meeting this brother um, through a colleague of mine, uh, through the, the vice president of Young Boss Media, Raphael. Thank you so much for this introduction. Um, this this is mind blowing. You know, in America, we learn about you know going into healthcare or being coming a teacher or being a nurse. We don't really think about you know the companies that refuel planes. We don't really have access to that. Uh, our education system just doesn't give us that unless you have somebody that can kind of mentor you and pull you in. So I hope you were able to really. Uh, one, catch the game about this industry, but also start looking around to other industries and think about, you know, what are their processes? What's their supply chain? And see how you can fit into those chains as well. So you know who it is. Your girl, Monica Sekman Grant, always trying to get into somebody's business so I can understand more about my business and also bring it to you as well, because we do not have to work these jobs if we don't want to. There's so much opportunity out here. So once again, this is a mentorship call on Young Boss Media. Make sure you subscribe to all of our platforms, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. We everywhere. Instagram. Also, you can go to youngbossmedia.com right now. Check out all our shows. And you can pre-order Mind Your Business and Prosper, a Young Entrepreneur's Guide for Success. Right now, you can get a signed copy. I will send it to you. And then also, it will be up for global release on August 17th. Now, thank you so much. That's my time. Peace and love.